Here's a cool little project. Uh, I made this nameplate out of a piece of plywood where I routed out the letters with my little T8 CNC engraver. And after I was done engraving it, I filled in the letters with um, some ebony wood filler, sanded it flat, and that got the result uh, that you're looking at. But uh, I'm not sure that I like the ebony as much as I thought I would, so in the next iteration, we're gonna use some metal and it should turn out pretty nice. And I thought that I would show you guys the whole process from start to finish uh, in a video while I do that. Yeah, and that's actually pretty necessary because in the last video, I showed you guys how to use ArtCam Free, which was a program that Autodesk uh, was offering. But since that video was released, Autodesk killed that program. It's really no big thing. That was a very hobbled program. They'd removed a lot of the functionality in an effort to get you to pay for the full version. So um, the freeware and actually open source software that we're gonna use today is a plugin for Inkscape. So really all you need to do is install Inkscape and you should be uh, on your way to, to getting some great results with your little router. Speaking of the first video, if by some weird circumstance you haven't already seen it, uh, I will provide a link right here. Yeah, I think that's about all I have to cover here in this intro. So all I have to do now is prepare my stock piece of wood and then we can start preparing the digital file and after that we can cut. I found this piece of firewood and it was basically already in this shape. And I'm just using my little hand plane here to just sort of square it up. And then I've got to just get this front face nice and flat. Hondax. And here we are looking at Inkscape, which is the program that we're going to use today. And this program has an extension called G-Code Tools. And you used to have to download this uh, from some Russian website, but now it just comes pre-installed in your uh, Inkscape installation file. So, very cool. Um, well, anyway, my project, I've actually measured it out and it is 85 millimeters wide by 45 millimeters tall. So, the first thing we wanna do is make sure that we're in millimeters here in Inkscape. And we accomplish that by going right there to that little uh, drop-down menu. So now let's edit our document properties and we're gonna make our actual project be the width and the height of your cuttable area. So uh, in my case, that is 85 millimeters wide and there, there's the units, right? We gotta make sure those are correct and 45 millimeters tall and that'll be good. That's all I need to do there. Close that down and now using the control button, I can use my mouse wheel to scroll in and out. If I just use my scroll wheel without the control button, then you can see it just scrolls up and down. So mouse wheel and control zooms in and out. And also if you click here in empty space, then hold your space bar down, you can just slide your project around. So those are two nice little hotkeys here in uh, Inkscape. Okay, so I want to uh, actually start using guides. And what you do is you click on the ruler there and you drag right on down into space. So you click and drag the ruler basically onto your project. And what that accomplishes is it draws these little blue lines. And the blue lines don't really mean anything. They just, uh, not like that. They just kind of, uh, they're, they're, they're guides. You can snap to them, like the program, and you can turn the snap on and off if you want to. But um, So it is kind of nice to have them just for reference uh, while you're uh, making your file. So. Um, uh, you can see what I'm doing there, drawing those. There we go, that looks pretty good to me. And again, I'm just eyeballing this. Um, there's more precise ways to use this program as well as uh, CAD programs that you can get. But uh, you know, this is an art project that we're doing. This is not uh, CAD work. So the next thing I wanna do is come over here onto the toolbar and grab this little pencil Bezier uh, tool. And I'm just gonna, draw roughly my uh, D. And so if I just click and then move on, I get a corner. You see how that's a sharp corner? But if I click and hold, it makes this like curved thing appear, see it? And so I'm gonna click and hold there, click and hold there, click and hold there, and then snap back to my original. And we got an ugly D, but that's okay. We'll come back and fix it later. Let's do the same for the A here. Okay, and by the way, you can right click and it just sort of um, uh, 
it ends your, your path. It stops the command or whatever that you're doing. So um, if I hold the shift button, or I'm sorry, if I hold the control button down, it snaps me. See, I'm moving the, the cursor a little bit and it's pretty much staying straight vertical or horizontal, excuse me. So control button is your friend. And again, right click. And then we got the X. We can actually use this button right up here, which is your edit paths tool by nodes. And I can just slide this. Oh, you know what? I don't want to do it that way. I want to just scale it down. So again, I can scale it and get it all kinds of funky, but if I hold the control button down, it maintains proportions. So uh, control button's nice. Okay, so there's that. And then I'll just click that again and control C, control V for copy and paste. And we'll just snap that into that corner there. And um, you know what? Let's change all of these curves now. Let's just highlight all of these things. Come over here into the stroke, the stroke panel and um, we will just go right over here to stroke style and we will change the width on these to be, uh, let's make it actual uh, millimeters because I wanna simulate this as close as I can to my bit. My bit is a 1 8 inch bit, so that is 3.18 millimeters wide. So that's currently what my paths are gonna look like, but I do need to round the ends on them, so the caps need to be rounded. So if I routed this out, that is what it would currently look like. Not bad, maybe it looks like a kid drew it, uh, but you know what, I, I, I don't really want it to look like that. So um, now we wanna click on the uh, edit paths by nodes button and we can just drag those around and then we can drag these ears here. Um, if I hold the control button and zoom in, I can kinda get some fine tuning going on here. And you can just tell what I'm doing, you guys. It's pretty obvious. I'm just gonna massage this geometry until it looks the way that I want it to look. Um, just lots of little movements here. And this is kind of the art of Inkscape. This is very much a different workflow than what you would do if you were drawing in CAD, for instance. But yeah, you guys get the idea. I'm not gonna sit here uh, and do this on camera uh, because I've already done it. This is the file once it's all looking right. And obviously I got rid of all of my guides by just clicking and dragging them on back onto the rulers. So the next thing we need to do is go up here to extensions and G code tools. And then we're gonna first give it orientation points. And this is just kind of telling it where it sits in space, where the, where the stock sits relative to where the bit's gonna go. So it's remembering values from the last time that I did this project and you want these values. So the Z surface, that's your, your, the, 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 the top of your stock, the, the surface that you're gonna be cutting into, and that's always at zero. That's just a convention that we use uh, in CNC routers and mills. Um, and in my case, I wanna go down to negative three millimeters. Um, you may wanna go deeper, but uh, that's up to you. So um, just click on apply, and it's gonna think for a second and do a thing. And then you can close that dialog box. Let's hold the control button down, zoom out on this, select that right there, hold the shift button down. Whoops, I'm sorry, hold the control button down. I'm so used to all my other programs that use the shift button to accomplish what Inkscape accomplishes here with the control button. So uh, it just, it's a little bit weird for me. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's not bad. Okay, so there we are, and I just sort of made it smaller. So this is our zero, zero point, bottom left. And if you remember, I talked about that in the last video. Uh, so that's zero X, zero Y, and zero Z. Now that we've done that, let's go to extensions, G-code tools, and do a tools library. We need to basically tell it the type of tool that it's gonna be uh, uh, cutting this with. So um, there's all these other types of things you could do with G-code tools. This one's really interesting, the cylinder. If you have an Eggbot, look up Eggbot if you don't know what that is, really cool little thing. Uh, but you can use G-code tools to make your designs for the eggs, like for, for Easter or whatever. Um, or you could just be doing a CNC machine on, a, on an actual cylinder. So um, I don't know what graffiti is, and I don't think uh, G-code tools hasn't been developed for years. I think it's been like three years since the last, three or four years since the last uh, development of this uh, program came out. It was made by some Russian guy, and I don't know, he must have gotten a job uh, hacking US elections or something, I don't know. So uh, at any rate, this is what we're stuck with, but it works, so I'm not complaining. So we'll just click apply, 
and we're gonna see this ugliness, but that's okay. Close this down, control button, zoom out, click there, control button, resize. See, if I wasn't holding the control button, again, it's being all ugly. And we'll just put that up to there. Control. Okay, now I can see everything that's going on pretty easily. Holding the space button there to space bar there to move things around. Okay. Here in the toolbar on the left, we select the A, and that's just our text editor. And we come over here and we give the tool an ID. This is really inconsequential, but let's just do it anyway. One eighth inch ball and mill. Sure, and let's mix up our capitals and our and our lowercase like a crazy person. That sounds good to me. All right, uh, diameter. Now this is, again, sort of inconsequential, but it's good for us to know, and that is 3.18 millimeters. We're in millimeters and it's an eighth inch uh, bit, so that's the measurement there. Um, our feed, now this is very important. This is the key to almost the whole project right here. This is the speed at which the bit is going to be moving through the wood. And this little mill uh, is really not robust. So I don't know if you guys can see this on camera, but as I move that, as I grab it by the bit, that whole X carriage is moving. It's moving down here. If I move it this way, can you guys see the gap getting wider and closer to the uh, stepper motor there? So it's flexing here, it's flexing there, it's flexing everywhere. So that should answer the question that all of you have, <laughs> so many people, uh, want to know if this machine will work on metal. The answer is no, it won't. You need a very stiff machine uh, to cut metal, and this is not going to do it. Don't buy this machine thinking you're going to be CNCing some aluminum parts for your car or something like that. This is, this is an introductory machine. It will teach you how to uh, play with G-code. It'll teach you a lot of the things you need to know, and then you can graduate to an actual CNC machine. Maybe you can modify a Harbor Freight mill or something like that, but this is not for metal, you guys. Anyway, so because this is such a uh, sort of wimpy machine as far as stiffness goes, we have to move through the material really slowly. And that means uh, we're gonna set our feed to uh, 50 millimeters per second. Now, I already did this project. You saw the nameplate in the intro there. Um, and this was the feed that I used. Maybe you can get away with more, um, if you're going to be turning these things out, you know, production or something, you might want to play with how fast you can go, but eventually you're probably going to break the bit, and that's no fun. So uh, let's just be cautious here and go with 50 millimeters a second for the, um, for the feed. I don't know what this shape thing means. That's just the code, internal code here. Penetration angle is 90 degrees. We're drilling at 90 degrees to the stock. Penetration feed, now this is a key here too. You always drill slower than you mill. Right, because drilling is, it's just a harder thing to do. Uh, it's got to clear chips out, and especially a mill is not a drill bit, so it wasn't, it's not designed to clear those chips out and everything. So let's go with 25 millimeters a second. Let's go with half the speed that we're, that we're actually augering out material with. So, okay, that looks good, that works. Uh, my passing feed, that's the feed that once it pulls up and out of the stock after it's done cutting and it's moving to the next letter, just moving in the air, that's this speed. So let's set that at the machine's maximum feed, which is 200 millimeters a second. But actually, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna try something different here. Let's go with 400. The depth of step. This is the last sort of critical uh, variable that you have to declare. Um, I wanna do this in five lifts. In other words, I, I can't, because the machine is so wimpy, I can't cut through all the stock three millimeters deep in a single pass. This machine will not handle that. Um, so I'm gonna do this in five lifts just to be safe. And that means 0.6 because three millimeters divided by five is 0.6. So 0.6 of a millimeter, each of my cuts is gonna be that deep. And the final thing to sort of declare here is the fine feed. And I don't really know what this is, but let's just give it a value of 200. It seems like passing feed and fine feed and I don't know. Maybe 50, let's just do that. Same as feed. I don't think it matters, but there we go. Okay, so now I can hold the uh, control button down, zoom out a little bit, and we're ready to go. Believe it or not, that's all there is to it. Um, so we're gonna go extensions, G-code tools, and
path to G code. We don't even need to select the path because we're gonna select the paths uh, here in the dialog boxes. The cutting order, pass by pass, uh, is the way that I like to do it. What this means is that the router bit is going to plunge into the stock uh, 0.6 millimeters deep. So that's where the negative 0.6 uh, value came from. Then it's going to uh, cut out the D, the A, and the X at that negative 0.6 value before lifting up, going back to the D, and plunging down to 1.2 millimeters, cutting out all the letters there. And we'll do that at each depth pass until we're at the, uh, the ultimate depth. Um, so this is the pretty standard, typical way of, of milling things out, but it's not your only option. You can also do it, um, so subpath by subpath means that it's gonna do each little section of each letter and it's gonna cut it to full depth in five passes and then move on to the next little section of the letter. So for instance, it's gonna cut the vertical bar here on the D all the way to depth, five passes. Then it's gonna cut the little semicircle here five passes down, then it's gonna cut this semicircle. You get the idea. So uh, I like pass by pass, I'm gonna stick with it. Depth function D, just leave that where it is. Uh, this all works. Options, so comment G-code. Don't comment the G-code. We're gonna have to remove all comments anyway. We'll get to that. Um, scaling along the Z, you don't wanna scale that thing you want it to be, and you don't wanna offset it Z either, so just leave those, so just leave those alone. Now the key here is this select all paths if nothing is selected. Um, so that's, that's what we wanna do there. And that, that's gonna select the D and the A and the X without having to do it manually. Preferences here, let's just call this file dax.nc. Now .nc is your extension for G-code. Uh, so just stick with that. And I'm gonna save this to my desktop with a Z safe height for G moves over the blank. So what this means is this is the a uh, height above the stock that it's gonna move in between letters. So two millimeters seems fine to me, but uh, yeah, two millimeters seems good. And the units are in millimeters, that's key. Actually, everything on this screen is really important. Um, post processor, none. And yeah, that looks good. So here's another interesting quirk to uh, G-Code tools. You have to go back to this tab, the path to G-Code, before you click apply. And when you click apply, it's gonna generate our G-Code. So let's click that button right now. No paths are selected. Trying to work on all available paths, okay. And now we can see that it has drawn in these funky colors and that is the representation of uh, the paths that the machine's gonna take. So we can just close this down and then what we need to do is open up that G-code file in our text editor. Let me be the first to tell you guys that this next step we're about to do probably isn't necessary. Um, we probably do not need to go and clean up the G-code, but I had some problems with my Arduino, uh, the brain box controlling my machine, and this seems to kind of help it. So basically it works like this. The G-code that I was sending from G-code tools in Inkscape wasn't working. I was getting errors whenever I tried to cut those files. But when I would send files made by ArtCam or another uh, G-code generating program, I wouldn't have any problem. So where's the problem coming from? Let's take a look at the G-code written by the other programs first to get an idea of what like good clean G-code looks like. So this is some G-code generated by ParkCam and we can see that there's one comment here at the beginning. A comment is in parentheses. And then it's just line after line. There's spaces, but it's pretty much line after line of just clean G-code. No comments, no nothing else, just straight up G-code. And if we look over here in ArtCam, we see it, it's no comment at all. It's just all line after line of G-code. Now, uh, this N20, N30, that's not a G-code command, that's just a line number. So line number 20, line number 30, and then the G-code starts here. So G40 is your first, uh, well actually G91 is the first bit of G-code. We can see that it's just very clean, right? And looking at the G-code spit out by GCAD tools in Inkscape, we see just tons of comments and that's not good. So yeah, uh, it can work. And in fact, I have gotten it to work using this exact file uh, the way that it is. But this was after doing a hard reboot on the Arduino. Now that means that you basically power it off hold down the reset button as you're powering it off 
and even power it back on with the reset button. Now, you should know that the Arduino powers up when it's plugged in to your computer with the USB cable or when it's plugged into the 12 volts uh, from the back. So if you only unplug one or the other, it's still powered up. It's also a good idea to hold down that reset button for like 10 seconds maybe uh, to really discharge all the capacitors that are on the board. So uh, some funny things can happen with these little microprocessors and just to be safe, that sort of hard reset is uh, prudent. But even with a hard reset, I don't fully trust the Arduino not to pop some errors in the middle of a job and I really don't wanna do that. So I try to do everything I can to ensure a successful cut. And that means that it's prudent to clean up the G-code so that there's an absolute minimum chance of, of tripping up the Arduino uh, with some extraneous stuff in there like comments. So the first thing we wanna do is let's just get rid of this comment right here under the G21. That's gonna always be there. And then also let's get rid of these penetrate comments. See they're, they're after a line G, G01 penetrate and then down here we see it again. So we need to go control F for find. We'll click on replace and then we will just copy this. So we'll paste that into there and then we'll replace it with nothing. I've pressed the backspace, there's nothing there and then I will click on the replace all button. And you can see that all of my penetrate or penetrative uh, comments are now gone. Another thing to find and replace just to get it all nice and clean for the machine is spaces. We really don't need them. So I'm gonna type space. So you can't see it, but there's an invisible space right there in the find what field. And then backspace so in the replace with so that there's nothing in that field and replace all. And you'll watch the G code, boom, all the spaces disappeared. So now what we can do is actually we need to control F and we need to mark now. Right up here, there's this bookmark line. Click that and we're gonna mark all, but what we're gonna mark is left parentheses. So we should have gotten rid of all the left parentheses that weren't uh, on their own line. So every left parenthesis now should be on its own line. So let's mark all and then we can just close that down. And taking a look here, we can see that there is no line that has G-code that has a parentheses. Now the parentheses just means a comment and that's something that the machine is supposed to ignore, but all of these comments seem to be tripping up the Arduino sometimes. So what we will do now is go to search, bookmark, remove bookmarked lines. Boom, our G-code is now very clean. You should also delete the percentage sign at the very beginning of the document and at the very end of the document. And finally, add a G90 command here at the very top of the uh, document. File, save. Hopefully, after doing all of that, your machine will not pop any errors or do any weird behaviors. So if you guys will remember from the last video, we have this little xloader.rar uh, program, and that is um, the way that we flash the firmware on our machine. And what we want to do real quick is update that firmware to be the newest, latest, greatest version. So that would be Gerbil 1.1. And what I've done is uh, the hard work for you guys. So I went into Arduino and configured the machine. Um, primarily that means I got it running with a uh, spindle that's either on or off. So there is no speed control on this spindle. And that's the major thing, but there's a few other little things that I did. Um, so yeah, if you want a copy of this uh, little hex file right here, check out the description down below. But for the sake of the video, let me just show you. We're just gonna open that here in the Xloader program. And we're gonna select COM5 because that's what my router is connected to. And then we're just gonna upload. Okay, so that is uploaded. Now we want to open a Gerbil controller. So that's what we're looking at here and our COM port. Once again, it's COM5, baud rate is 115200, and just click on open. Before you guys get started, you will need to do, you'll need to change four lines here. So the first is dollar sign three equals four, and that will change the machine to be in the correct uh, directions, X, Y, and Z. Press enter. And then you will need to change dollar sign 100, dollar sign 101, and dollar sign 102 to be 800, 800, so that's 800 steps per millimeter. So after you've done all that, you can dollar sign, dollar sign, enter, and see the new configuration codes pop up, and you can just double check to make sure that they all match with what you're seeing here on my screen. Now the key tell uh, between 
Gerbil 0.9 and Gerbil 1.1 is Gerbil 0.9 had a dollar sign 14, whereas Gerbil 1.1 has removed the dollar sign 14 uh, configuration point. Okay, so we are connected and we should be ready to go. Let's give this thing a feed rate. So that's G0 F700. If we set our step size to 10, uh, that would be uh, 10 millimeters. And let's just click on this button right here and we see it moves. So pretty cool. Uh, move it back, move it up in the Y, move it down in the Y, move it down in the Z. Whoa, collided with the material a little bit there. Move it up in the Z. That's because I'm moving 10 millimeters, which is a lot. Um, so the final thing to check here is the, uh, I need to plug in my spindle. I keep it unplugged here just because I don't really want that running here in a second, but um, I'll just click this little spindle on and you can see it clicks it on and off. So we can see that the machine, I have actually plugged in both wires to the motor. Now you could just unplug one of those wires and that way the motor would not turn on. But the other option is around back here, you can just unplug the 24 volt feed because the 24 volts feeds the motor. So we don't wanna run the motor right now, we're just gonna do a test run. We're gonna do a dry run an air cut up above the, the stock. So here in Gerbil Controller, we're gonna choose file. So wherever you saved your file, open that file. Um, and now we can see the geometry and hopefully it's that same old clean geometry. Now, if we get an error, like I said, we just have to unplug everything except the 12 volts, hold down that reset button, unplug the 12 volts, let off the reset button and everything should be copacetic. But I've just done that, so I think this is gonna run just fine. Let's give it a try. The first thing we need to do is click this zero position button. So the bit, you can see it's pretty close to zero, zero there. And we're just gonna click the zero, it tells the machine it's at zero, zero. So I'm gonna begin this file and I'm actually gonna let it run through all the letters one time at a single depth pass. That's gonna be 0.6 millimeters down into the uh, stock. But, but that's gonna be 0.6 millimeters below its current height, which is up in the air. So we will be okay. So let's begin. Okay, we can stop that now because we um, have seen it go through at least one whole cycle. It wrote the A, the X, and then the D. So if I click this, six times on the close reset, it usually, there we go. And then if I click the open, it shuts the machine off. So that's one way to force it to stop. Okay, so we're in business and ready to do the actual cut. This is exciting. Let's um, get that machine set up right where it needs to be and we will send the cut for real this time. I've made this little piece of paper just for my own reference and it measures uh, 45 millimeters by 85 millimeters in the long dimension. So, if I put that onto my stock, I can see right about where I would like the word DAX to appear. If you'll remember, my stock setup in Inkscape was also 45 by 85. So what I'm gonna do here is just dial this in. So we're gonna drop that down till it's just catching the paper. Actually, that looks pretty good. We can come a little bit farther that way and a little bit farther that way. And now I'm nice and centered right where I like it. Um, Let's actually drop that a little bit lower even still. Okay, I like it right there. We're gonna cut that. Back to the computer and looking at Gerbil controller, we have reconnected. We're gonna hit the zero position. So we have told it we're at zero, zero, zero. Just to make sure that we're connected, let's um, turn the spindle on. We hear the click of the uh, relay, but we don't get the spindle turning on. And that is because we have the 12 volt power unplugged. So we'll just plug this in right here. And now when we turn the spindle on, we're good to go. So we're not messing around. We're doing this for real this time. I won't get a second chance with this stock because I don't have much actual wood to play with. The majority of it is bark. And uh, so if I have a mistake here, then I'm SOL. So here we go. Let's press the begin button.
Oh, my stock totally moved and that ruined the piece, um, which is a total bummer. Now this happened for one reason and that is because I did not have sufficient clamping holding it down. Um, you see, this stock piece is really funky. It's got bark on the back and I was trying to clamp it down flat without it sort of moving around on me. And to make matters even worse, the stock itself is thicker than the, uh, than the hardware that came with the machine can accommodate. So um, I couldn't use these metal bolts and instead I made up, like I jerry-rigged these pieces of wood with some wood screws and was using that to clamp. And it worked for the first two passes, but uh, once we started to get to a certain depth, uh, it just it totally broke loose. It vibrated loose and that's no good. So uh, basically we have to use the, the hardware that came with the machine. And I'm gonna go down to Home Depot and buy some um, walnut wood which should look really clean and not, quite nice. In, in fact, it'll probably be better looking than, than this thing. So maybe not quite as artistic, but still pretty cool. So I'm gonna try that cut again uh, with some walnut. I've got my walnut stock board securely attached to the machine with the metal hardware. That shouldn't move at all and I'm ready to begin. So let's just hit the begin button. And we're done, how cool is this? Uh, so the metal hardware definitely did its job and kept this walnut block securely in place. And we're ready to do the next step of the project, which is to inlay the metal in the grooves left behind by this router. So let's just carefully remove this uh, project and save that sawdust, because we might need it. Uh, and then we'll, we'll start with the inlay process. Out in the garage, I'm doing the metal inlay. So I got this um, six gauge copper wire and you can buy it at Home Depot or Lowe's just by the foot. It's like 30 cents a foot. Um, but yeah, six gauge means it measures 3.35 or so uh, in the diameter. Well, our uh, slots made by the router bit, which was a 1 8 inch router bit, measure 3.18 uh, millimeters across. So this wire is just a little bit bigger than the slot, which is exactly what we want. So I've just been using uh, these hand tools uh, to do the inlay here. Um, and it starts off with simply just cutting off a length of the wire. And then on the file here, I just round over that end. And it takes a little bit of work, but eventually you get a nice blunty end that sort of matches the radius of the wire itself. I have this great hand tool called a Kinepex, and it's kind of a cross between pliers and a crescent wrench, but it works really well for straightening metal out because it uh, has a parallel motion to the jaws. So that's what I do after I get my wire all nice and round on one end. Straighten it out, line it up with my, uh, with my hole there, and I kind of go right to the edge of the hole, a uh, little bit a little bit proud even. Better to be too long than too short. You can always shave off more with the file. So now I've got these uh, jeweler's pliers and those just work really well for bending wire. That's what they're designed to do. So I'll just bend the wire a little bit and then test fit it. See where I need to bend it some more. It's just sort of a trial and error, test fit by test fit. Let me tell you guys, that D took me a little bit of time to, to get it completed. Uh, but it came out really good, so uh, I'm sure the A here won't be too much of a challenge. And that is a good fit, so that will work out just fine. And in order to get it in there, I've just been using this uh, plastic mallet. I could almost leave it just the way it is. It's kind of cool, actually, with the, uh, with the roundedness to the, to the letters. But um, there's some scratches from working the wire into shape, and there's this seam right here on the D that I don't really like. So we're actually going to bring it down to where it's flush with the wood. 
And we're going to do that using a file. And, and now it's just a bunch of sanding. There are a few small gaps, uh, so that's why we saved that sawdust. We can just lay down some glue and mix in the sawdust and make a nice wood filler that perfectly matches the, uh, the walnut because it is the same material. Sawdust came from the stock. And here it is, all cut to size, shaped, and sanded up to 500 grit. So all I have left to do is to coat it with a nice application of some polyurethane uh, finish. And I'll give you guys the glamour shot of that uh, at the very end of this video. So uh, yeah, what do you think, Dax? Pretty cool? Um. I think he likes it. So the customer approves, and that's a good thing. All right, well, hey, this is YouTube. Click all the good buttons. If you haven't rang that bell already, do that because I've got some good uh, videos coming up and it would be a shame if you missed them. Uh, all right, thanks for watching. See you next time.